loves us without end. Amen. And dedicate this to all the dads and also remembering our dads that have passed on as well. Amen. I got sent home from school one day with a shiner on my Fighting was against the rules, it didn't matter why. When Dad got home, I told that story just how I rehearsed. And stood there on those trembling knees and waited for the words. He said, let me tell you a secret about a father's love. A secret that my daddy said was just between us. stubborn boy was just like my father's son and when I thought my patience had been tested to the end I took my father's secret and passed it on to him he said let me tell you a secret about a father's love a secret that my daddy said was just between us died and stood outside those pearly gates but suddenly I realized there must be some mistake if they know half the things I've done they'll never let me in but somewhere from the other side I heard these words again they said let me tell you a secret about a father's love A secret that my daddy said Was just between us See, daddies don't just love their children Every now and then It's a love without end, amen It's a love without end Father's Day.
For those that don't know, this is my song. This is a song that I recorded when I was 16. And a lot of us in this room, we have a similar story that we wait for our father to come back. And if you come from a home that has been broken, you know exactly what I mean. And we wait for our fathers. And I want to encourage all the fathers that are here today that your presence, it matters. It matters. Your presence at home, it matters. It matters. There are children, there are, are, are young girls, there are sons that are broken, but there's nothing that God can't fix. And maybe your, your marriage has, you know, you've gone separate ways, and that's fine. But what I want to encourage mothers and fathers that we continue to be in the lives of our children it doesn't stop you got to continue to be the father and the mother in your children's lives and I thank the Lord because growing up I pastor Reuben you've heard the story many times you know he was he loved me he was persistent and what I didn't understand what love was because I didn't have that love from, um, you know, that fatherly love at home. And when this young boy would tell me he loved me, I thought he was absolutely crazy because I felt like my own fathers don't even show me that love. So when this boy told me he loved me, I didn't understand that. 
But I thank the Lord because God had a plan all these all this time. He had a plan that God was going to bless me with a man that truly could show me what love was. And I want to encourage you today to not don't give up. Don't give up hope. Don't lose hope. Continue to pray. Continue to be faithful to the Lord because God will bless you. And I thank the Lord because my home was broken. But I thank the Lord because I sowed many tears as a childhood. I sowed many tears as a teenager so that my children wouldn't have to go through what I went through. The generational curse has been broken with me. Amen. And so I tell my children time and time again, you guys are blessed. I tell Zeta, I tell Zion, Zoya, and Jovi, you are blessed to have your father. You are blessed to have your mother and father in the home. And I thank the Lord for those fathers that step up when they don't have to. Amen. And they are the fathers of their children, of their stepchildren, and they show up and they're the father. You know, sometimes we feel like blood makes us family but I'm here to tell you it's the ones that show up and never leave are our family that show up time and time again by their actions they show that they love us that they're there for us so I just want to tell my husband Pastor Ruben happy Father's Day I love you so much you're amazing you're amazing and I know I probably don't tell you enough but I love you so much you're not only amazing to my children, but you're amazing spiritual father here at the Holy One Church. I've got flowers for you in the back. If someone could get them, they're like tall. They've got candy in them and everything. <laughs> and um, we want, let's bless Pastor Reuben. Amen. Come on. Can we thank him this morning for being our spiritual father here at the Holy One Church? Not perfect. We're absolutely not perfect. But he has been faithful, and I can stand here before the Lord and tell you that Pastor Reuben has been faithful to me for 21 years. I was his first, and I am going to be his last. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm always messing with him. I'm like, if I die, you better mourn me at least five years. Five years, you better mourn me. Amen? But I thank the Lord for him, and uh, we are truly blessed to have Pastor Ruben in our lives. Where your head at? Dang, don't want to talk business, business. I guess I got to be the one to see the summer. Who really in this, in this? We so fed up. My life, 10 up. Yo time, been up. Big prayers, sent up. Uh, couldn't do without them, out of them. Uh, glad that I found them, found them. Uh, crowd really wild it, wild it. Uh, I'm kicking it, shouting, shouting. Hallelujah. What an amazing day. You know, um, so much, so much goes into our lives as we work and we, we get up daily and we show up. And we now live in a culture where, where the fathers have been diminished to, to, to nothing. Like, like we live in a time where if you turn on the TV, they... Oh, yes. Let's, let's have our children. We're going to dismiss our children to their classes. Let's give them a round of applause. Didn't they do amazing? That's one thing about the Holy One Church is that we'll always have our children leading. They'll always be presenting. This church will be always uh, keep our children at the forefront. Uh, if you teach them while they're young, what does the word of God say? They will never depart. You know, and it's never too late for some of us parents. Yeah, you, tus hijos están mayores, drag them still to church. Tell them, hey, on Father's Day, Mother's Day, you better be in church. Easter, you know, your Christmas. And if we could drag them every other day, oh, thank you, Jesus. But we live in a world that's so obsessed right now with living our best life. You know? No matter whether you turn on the TV or you watch a series or whatever you watch, everything's always about pushing, hey, it's time that you live your best life now, you know. And, and with this obsession comes a lot of things where, where the enemy will use against us through culture. We spent some time with men, the real men, all the real men in the house, say Ruah. Ruah. All right. You know, we spent some time this week talking about culture. Because how many know that in culture, it dictates a lot of things today. 
culture will determine a lot of things, but we got to be the church culture that makes a change. We got to be the men that make a difference. We got to be the men that wake up right now and say, you know what, enough's enough. The, the world is not going to push this on my children. It's not going to push this on my marriage. Their culture is not going to be our culture because our culture is going to live on the Bible, you know. But this obsession with living our best life, and, and, and you often see this on social media, uh, like hashtag living my best life, you know. Or you'll see hashtag goals, and there's all these images of comfort and and this is the way it's supposed to be but how many know that 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 life isn't perfect it's not perfect if anything it's evil because the word of God says that we're evil that even though we have Christ in us there's there's evil that pervades in this world that each day that we as men got to shut down We've got to shut down the evil that we face daily, you know. But we live in a time where people can fake everything, right? Everything in life it can be manipulated, can be faked. And, and i tell you this, um, no matter what, we got to get away from the fake life. We got to get away from the fakeness. We got to get away. Uh, back when we were growing up, we called it the Joneses, right? You know, how many remember that, right? The Joneses. It's just that friend that always has to up you. The neighbor that sees you with a new car and they got to get a better car or a better house or a, come on, it, it, it can go endless. And, and, and in this series, we're wrapping up is Chasing Carrots. I want us to stop chasing comfort. Because many of us think that comfort is what God planned for us. And I, we're far from that. We're far from the comfort. As a matter of fact, comfort can become idolatry, you know? Like comfort, it, it can become another God. The reality is that when we seek comfort, it, it's why we see a lot of people missing from church and the, because they'd rather be comfortable on the river rather than being in the word of God. They'd rather, they'd rather be comfort in other things rather than leading their family. But when their family is falling apart, when everything's destructed, when everything's coming apart, when, when, when everything's falling off the rails is when we find that we really need Jesus. But I tell you today, we've got to stop waiting till it gets bad to come to Jesus. We've got to stop waiting. We were seeing the depictions, the songs, and, and everything that was taking place. And, and, and even in the song, it talks about how, how there's this want and this longing for, for dad to, to come back in our lives, right? And this longing, it ends up transitioning and manifesting to the reality that God, our true father, was always there. When we realize that our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, is always there, then it doesn't matter whether you're abandoned. It doesn't matter whether you've been betrayed. It doesn't matter whether you've been lied to, cheated on, you know. It doesn't matter because our God, our Father, is there and is truly there. Now, let's read 1 John 2.15. 1 John 2.15. We got to get past the false teaching that has been, even it, it even comes into the churches of this, this lifestyle of Christians of comfort and living your best life. 1 John 2.15 says this, do not love God. The what? The world. Nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in who? Him. 17 times John uses the phrase, the world. You know? 
In his first letter, he, he shares this, this letter that he's written. He, he talks about the world in, 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 and, and reminds us that we're not part of this world. Like we're not, we are ambassadors here. And so many of us are, are building our lives in a place where one day you're going to be gone. Tell your neighbor, one day you're going to be gone. You're going to be gone one day. And so much of our life is invested in some of the things of comfort of this world. And what, one day you're going to get to heaven and be before God and answer to him. And he's going to say, what did you do with the time that I gave you on earth? What did you do with the time? Well, you know what? I was working on my 401k and my retirement plan. And I was trying to get my kids through all these schools and doing all these things. And not to say any of that's bad. But when you put it before God, oh, I can't get to church this Sunday because they're giving me overtime. And I got to rebuild and replenish that fund. And, and when your mind is set with things before God, it's idolatry. Doesn't mean we shouldn't enjoy the things that we give it, that God gives us. Every good gift comes from who? God. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't love creation because creation testifies about the glory of who? God. So there, it's just it's just we gotta find ourselves how uh, uh, on how to live in this system that we call the world. There's a system that says that this life doesn't need God. But the reality is that we need him more than we ever have before. You know, as we talk about the struggle, we, 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 we got to realize that slowly and slowly we drift away. We drift away into comfort and we get lazy. Hello? There's no lazy people in this house, right? Men, you remember when you're trying to win your girl? Uh-oh. No, hombre. They, they were poets. How many uh, wives remember when your husbands were, were writing poems to you? Hello. Uh-oh. They were writing poems. Some would even write songs and, 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 and they would have scavenger hunts to, you know what, I love you, babe, and have that letter written and, and delivered. And, 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 ¿Qué pasó? Come on, ladies, tell, tell, tell your husbands right now, ¿qué pasó? Comfort, because of comfort, you know, we stop getting the flowers, we stop getting the gifts, we stop getting those things, ladies. We're not leaving you out. Hello, ladies. There is a day when you, when you used to still shave your legs, get all purdied up, and nombre, you 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 would go and when you go to eat, you would you would get a water. You know, with a salad to keep your shape. Everything was all about that. Nombre now, you, you, <laughs> now you, we, we, got <laughs> it's Father's Day. We get away with everything today. <laughs> I got a lot of serious faces right now. Now, now it's just about slipping on the date night tights, the comfort tight. Everything's about tights. But back then, hombre, you would make sure you had that dress. You did all that. Now, hombre, it's all about comfort. Everything's about comfortable. Like, get over it. You already have me. Hello. But the reality is that we always need to cultivate, build, and always have that chase because men are driven with the chase. That is why many men are falling away into adultery, falling away into other things because too many people get comfortable. We got to get away from comfort and seek and seek and chase. The, the reality is this. God has made us 
to be united. God has made us to love one another. God has made us for relationships. So whatever God creates, what does Satan do? He counterfeits. And I'll tell you this, many people are chasing a counterfeit of comfort. It's a close copy. It's a substitute for something with value. But counterfeit has no value, you know. So chasing counter, uh, a counterfeit co uh, comfort reveals spiritual emptiness. That's what it does. It, it reveals that we are empty spiritually. That is why 1 John 2.15, which we just read, says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Really quick, you can, you can tell. When somebody loves something more than God, you know the love of the Father is not in him. It's not. You don't have to tell him. You just know. Think, think about God's love towards the lost, towards the hurting, towards the poor and the weak. He is, his love is sacrificial. It's faithful. You know? We, we, we've been spending the past several months in doing the community lunch. And as we've been doing this, we've been able to encounter people in situations that blow my mind. Because as you're driving down these streets, if you take the time for a moment just to look around, you'll see how many people are sleeping behind buildings, under ditches, and you, and and. And a ton of these people are riding bikes. I thought it was something that was inspired, you know, hey, get on your bike and, you know, we're, we're trying to use less vehicles and stuff. No, these people are homeless. They're living on the streets. And, 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 and I know we can't eradicate poverty because in a lot of senses, even these people are a whole lot richer than people all over the world. I had learned in the past several weeks and during the study that uh, the statistics came out that 3 billion people, 3 billion, how many people are on this planet? Seven. Seven billion. Three billion live without running water and without electricity. Wow. Isn't that mind blowing? Yet, we still seek comfort knowing that we have accesses to things that a lot of people don't have. These accesses shouldn't just be something that we have and take for granted, but they should be used as tools to expand the kingdom of God. In other words, you have an AC in your home, enjoy it because you, you can rest before you go out and share the gospel to somebody. You, you enjoy the things that you have so that you can open up your mouth. The culture has to change in the church that you're not coming to feed yourself, but you're coming so that you can feed others. What is the food that we're talking about? Spiritual food. There's spiritual food. The, the table's been set. And, and so many Christians lack the, the understanding of the the calling that is in your life. Your calling isn't to show up every Sunday, hello, to just fill your head with more information. Your calling is to come to be filled and renewed in your spirit so that you can get out of these walls, out of these doors, and open your mouth and say that Jesus, to someone that Jesus loves them. Jesus is calling you. And the reality is that as you seek comfort, it reveals that you're spiritually empty. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says this, For Christ's love, Christ's love compels us that those who live should no longer live for who? Themselves. But for him who died for them and was raised again. I want to read this. I want you to get it in your heart right now. For Christ's love compels us. Who compels us? Christ's love. 
that those who live should no longer live for themselves. If you are living and breathing, because you are right now in this room, you should no longer live for yourselves, but for him who died for you and was raised again. See, God is the most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. He's glorified when you're satisfied. You got to come to a place where you're good. You got to come to a place where you say, hey, I'm, I'm good with where I'm at. I'm good with where, 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 where we're going because I'm going to get better, right? You got you to gotta settle with some things. You got to stop chasing because some of us all have these plans and we're like, man, I'm going to build this business. I'm going to build this. I'm going to build this house. I'm going to do all these things. And those things are good. But when you put God first, all those things will come into place. They will happen, but they cannot be your first priority. God has to be your first priority. It's got to be God, you know? Chasing this counterfeit comfort also eliminates our need for faith. When you're chasing things, when you have the money, you ain't looking for God. When everything's going well, nobody's looking for God. It, isn't it funny that when we share the gospel with somebody that has money, they look at us sarcastically. And I was sharing this with a brother the other day. I was telling him, because the question was asked, how do you minister to people with a lot of money? Like they feel like they don't need God. But the reality is I've seen a, a lot of people with a lot of money on their deathbeds. And their money cannot do nothing to save their lives. It cannot do nothing. Also when they're losing their marriage and it's done, it's over. Money cannot restore that. Money cannot restore the loss of a loved one. And yet so many people make it their idol. I'm telling you this. And, and when you, you're comforting, and you're chasing comfort, it eliminates our need for faith. By faith, we see Cain and Abel go and make a sacrifice. And God honors a sacrifice. But you know what? Abel... <laughs> You know what? He's there. He makes his sacrifice. And Cain says, you know what? I, why is he honoring his and not mine? And he kills his brother. It takes, it takes faith. Enoch was taken by God. He walked on this earth. And yet God took him. He never saw death. Yet, yet it takes faith. Faith to walk and know and trust God into things. Noah had to convince people about a flood. When these people had never in their life had seen rain. Imagine that. Imagine telling your friends, hey, this, this place is about to flood and people, everyone is going to die. And they're looking at you like, what are you talking about? They had never seen rain. It took faith. It took faith to build up and, and do all these things. Look at this. Abraham left his home. It took faith. He wasn't chasing comfort. He was comfortable where he was at. But God told him, get up, leave this place to a place that I'm taking you. I'm taking you to a promised land. I'm taking you to a place further away from this. God is taking you to a place also greater than this place. But it's going to take faith. Sarah believed that she would have a child. She couldn't. She was prophesied that she would have a child. And Sarah was like, what? At the, how, how could this happen at such an old age? She even laughed about it. But in faith, these things came to completion. I'm telling you this. So many things that you do in your life are not going to make sense. But it's going to take faith. It's going to take faith. It's going to take perseverance. And a lot of us are just driven by culture. And we got to put a stop to being driven by what the world says. I'm telling you this. I, I heard this story um, in a documentary about East India. About a business on the, at the top of a river that made a decision 
to pour out all its sewage into the water. All the sewage, all the contaminants. And these few people, as they made the decision, down the river, there was hundreds of thousands of people that lived off this river. In this documentary, it said that as they drove by that, the, down the river, it smelled like of the devil farted. That's how bad it was. Now, I don't know how a devil's fart smells, but it must be horrible. But as a result, they, they show in this documentary that, that there was these ladies that would go down to the river, get the water, and boil it to try to take all the contaminants out. And these hundreds of thousands of people had to live off this water that was contaminated by a few people who decided to destroy the river. And I started thinking about it and I said, well, it's much like the lives we live right now. Like, it takes a few people to make a decision of what you're going to see when you walk into a store. Hello. It takes a few people to make a decision on what's going to appear on TV. It's like we turn on a TV right now, and, and now the commercials got everybody, guys kissing guys, girls kissing girls. You can't even keep it away from your ki kids anymore. We would tell our kids, cover their eyes, cover their eyes. And you know what? Parents are like, man, you can't even escape this anymore. No, we could still turn off the TV. We could still take away the remote. I, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. I miss a lot of things, but my son doesn't. My son will walk in the room, and it's like, turn off those reels. Yeah. He wasn't turning them off when he was watching them. But he's making sure that every one of my daughters are not watching these reels anymore. Because while you think there's something innocent, you got all this mess, this culture that is ingrained into your children. So that when they start experimenting with things, they have no business experimenting. Whose fault is it? Come on, fathers. Take some blame right now. It's our fault. It's men. We make the decision. You know, it took, it took, it took some stupidity in, through Bud Light for there to become a movement, right? Right? Now it's like, man, uh, now it's a joke. A lot of people think that all the men said, hey, let's boycott. Let's do this. No, 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 no. This, this, this is what it really did. Nobody, nobody wants to get punked drinking some Bud Light. Hello? Like, now it's a joke. Like, somebody tell you, oh, man, hey, I wouldn't drink that, man, because nombre vas a andar medio curioso. You've been drinking. And if you're walking funny and weren't drinking, they say you were drinking some Bud Light. And, and it's driven by culture. A few, uh, an individual made a decision up the river, right, on up the river, and everyone else has to deal with it. But when is a church going to wake up and say, enough is enough? My kids don't need to be programmed by you. But the problem is it's so inconvenient. It's so inconvenient to put an extra little app or an extra little or delete certain things. No, you know what? My kids got to learn that anyways. And the thing is they end up being programmed. And then when you're trying to fix a situation, you can't because you weren't there when you should have been there. Ooh, some people aren't liking this message. Hebrews eleven six says, and without faith, faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It's going to take some faith walking through this mess. It's going to take some faith, you know. I was looking at a lot of our, our, our uh, programming that we have online and I've noticed a lot of stuff has gotten blocked. A lot of stuff has been deleted. A lot of audio has been taken off. So one was just because I said, hey, men got to get up and go back to work. Literally. That's offensive. While your wife is working, you need to get your butt up and get back to work. Like God has called us to be, to have dominion. Oh, yeah, this is Father's Day. Thank you, Jesus. If this is your first time to the church, welcome. We love you. We thank you. But the reality is this. Men have to be men. 
You know, like the culture is so messed up. Like, what is it going to take you to listen? We need a drag queen preacher to preach to you so that you listen. Like, what is it going to take? Again, it takes a little bit people up the river. And then what? We can't even clean the water anymore because it's all a mess. But I tell you this, it's time that we take out that little business on the top of the water and we trust God with the living water to, <laughs> to give us life and to give us life in abundance. The men are used to this because this is how we row in real men. Yeah. Pastora said, you got to preach this on a Sunday. I go, no, hombre, se, se me van a enojar las esposas porque estos hombres se están levantando los pantalones y lo que pasa. Some of, some, of, some of these men got in trouble coming home from our fishing trip because I heard it from some wise. No, hombre, se levantó los pantalones. But I go, let him. It's time that men become men. It's time that men lead in prayer. It's time that, le- oh, come on, mom. It's time that men lead in prayer. It's time that, le- that men lead in the household. Ladies, no, es que está menso, no sabe, está tonto. No, 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 no. Don't be depositing that in him. You build him up, you tell him he's great. When he prays a, a prayer, you know what? Thank you, God. I, I, I don't know what's going on here, but by faith, Father, we're going to do something great. Amen. That's it. Praise him. Don't tell him, man, where do you think that prayer is going to go? You think he heard that? You got to pray with, with fire. Because some of y'all ladies can pray with fire. But no, 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 no. You, you build up your man. You build up your man. You strengthen him with the words. Because I'll tell you this. One way to stop a man is with your words. You got to protect your man with the words that, are, that, are, that, that will tear them down. You know? But we got to realize that our sufferings are... are we, we're going to suffer while we're in Christ. You know, a lot of people, I hear this constantly. This is a general thing. You ever notice when you get closer to God, all hell breaks loose? All hell breaks loose. Anybody experience a little bit of hell the moment you got closer to God? And and it's easy to think, man, you know what? It was better when we were away. Like, man, when we were away, nothing was happening. Exactly. The devil ain't going to mess with you. You know why? Because the devil knows you're not going to open your mouth. And there's still, okay, so when you were away, but... What about the Christians that do show up to church and still don't open their mouth? God, the devil ain't messing with you. He ain't going to mess with you because guess what? He knows your commission. And the commission is for you to what? Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if he knows that you won't share the word of Jesus, he gonna leave him alone. Déjalo. He'll look at you and say those words. Oh, tamancito. He don't know nothing. He's dumb. But the moment you come to your fullness and you realize, hey, I'm going to open my mouth for Jesus. I'm going to say something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be vocal in this culture. Guess what? You're going to see stuff flying in your house. You're going to, uh, and they won't be coming from your wife. It's going to be coming from those demons that can't stand you, that don't want to hear you. And I tell you this, you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Look at what 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5 says. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of compassion and the God of what? All comfort. Who comforts us in all troubles. Not some troubles. All troubles. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God you see God has given you comfort he's the God of comfort he's the one that gives you comfort so that you can share the comfort of Jesus for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ so also our comfort abounds through Christ I'm telling you today, right now, you you serve Christ, 
and God will comfort you. He will comfort you. He will strengthen you. But you've got to embrace the discomfort. you got to come to the discomfort and say, hey, I got you. They're talking about you. Hug them. <laughs> they hate you. You love them. They betray you. You love them. They cancel you. You love them. It's going to be hard. But the same God of comfort who gives you comfort asks you to share comfort, which is the love of God. Embrace. Embrace a divine dis discomfort. Look at what James 1 says about this embrace. Consider it all joy. Tell your, tell your neighbor, consider it all joy. Consider it all joy, my brethren, that when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Consider it joy. Consider it joy when you're facing trials. Consider it joy when all hell's breaking loose in your house. Consider it joy when, when your spouse betrays you. Consider it joy when you lose your loved ones. Consider it joy when you're facing illnesses. Because this is what Jesus says. Knowing that the testing of your faith will produce endurance. Man, you're going to be strengthened through your trials. You, you, nobody buys a car without testing it unless you're crazy. You test drive things. God will put you through the test so that you can prove to have endurance, to have the strength, to have the stamina, to survive the battles. I'm telling you this. We got to wake up. Tell your neighbor, church, tell your neighbor, wake up. We, we got to wake up. We got to embrace. We got to embrace the discomfort. You know, nobody wants to work out anymore. We, I have been for years saying we're going to start on Monday. And it just never fails that we, well, even this week. We're, I was thinking about it. We're thinking, well, we'll start Monday because it's Father's Day this weekend. You know? But then, then when you start, you start with your squats, right? And then you start feeling it and you're like, no. <laughs> Baby, you want to go get a barbacoa taco? But we as a body of Christ... Have to not just read the word. Like, let me read this scripture right here in Romans 5 3. This is good. I'm reading it to myself. And this is refreshing. But I'll tell you this when you begin to read the word out loud, you are declaring war against the enemy. And many of us need to not only read the word as you're reading at home. You got to open up your mouth. Tell your neighbor, open up your mouth. You got to open up your mouth. You got to begin to speak the word because you are declaring war against the enemy. And when the enemy declares war against you, you need, to, you need to read the scripture out loud. You need to put some praise music. Don't leave room for the devil to be living in your house. Let's kick him out. Give him an eviction notice. Romans 5, 3 says this. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We got to embrace, finally, we got to embrace it. This isn't your best life. 
this isn't going to be your best life. Our best life is going to be in the presence of God. It's going to be with God. You got to realize that, that our, our preparation is what we're going to become in the kingdom of God. You ever wonder why we only live uh, uh, up to 70 years, 75 years? Why, why, why? Because guess what? God had enough mercy on us that he didn't want to see us live in 